set up our stand properly. Good morning, beauty. Good morning, beautiful ladies. I'm trying to make sure I set this up so that you can actually see it without a problem. I think that does it. Put myself over here. Ah. Lady E, I'm gonna look at it today and then send it back to you. Um, I was so tired last night, I definitely didn't look at anything. But I will look at it today. I'm trying to wait. So, I can turn on my recording. Let's see. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to record my session on the TV, but I'm afraid that if I start it now, um, Dateline <laughs> will record it and turn it off. <laughs> so. yeah. Got my big glass of tea today, man. trying to you know help my plants survive and can't put them outside because the rain keeps going so with the rain constantly going I can't put them outside because it'll be too much water on them and they'll drown so they in here dying slowly oh I feel so bad I can't put them outside I don't know if I should just like put them in a room and leave the lights on because they're highlight plants house plants so they need some bright light on them, but maybe this wasn't the best room. Maybe I need to find another room in the house and put them under some lights, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, I got, I guess I got my what's the name light. I could, but see that thing gets so hot. My little gold light, I can just shine directly on them. And maybe that'll help them out. Maybe I'll do that. We'll see, anything's worth a shot. In fact, let me go do that now. I got a little time. We haven't started yet. <laughs> Let's see.
All right, all right. Let's go ahead and get started. Great thumb. No suggestions. I know, man. Morning, Aaliyah. <laughs> all right, let us. All right, I've started class, woman. <laughs> all right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Aaliyah, make sure you have your packet for today. We are going to pick up and I'm going to record our session since this is 10. So the question for our warm up this morning is we are almost through with this book. Um, we will be finished with this book, like I said, next Friday. So we are at the end of class today. We will have been 70 percent of the way done. Um, so as we are nearing the end of Brian's journey, what do you predict might happen? And upcoming chapters. What do you predict might happen in the upcoming chapters? Type it in the comments. All right. So, making a prediction, what do we think might happen? We know he's on this river. I am once again going to say that I predict that he's just not going to make it. Like, either he's not going to make it or Derek's not going to make it. But I predict if Gary Paulson is going to make this a very good story, one of the candidates has to not make it. That's all I'm saying. Good morning. We're just making a prediction of what do you think might happen in the upcoming chapters because we're almost finished with the book. We left off with Derek and Brian being on a raft going down the river. What do you think? And I just explained to Aaliyah, I believe that if this were, you know, a great story as Gary Paulson could make it, that one of them should not make it. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I don't think both of them should, you know, rightfully so make it. One of them should, you know, fall off the raft or get mauled by a bear or something. It's no fun if both of them survive. So what do you think? What do you think might happen in the upcoming stories, upcoming chapters? I'll give you about two more minutes to write your prediction in the comment section. And then we are going to move on. Good morning, Torian. Good morning, Jayon. We are just making a prediction of what we believe might happen in the upcoming chapters. And I think that one of the characters should die. That's just me. I don't think that they should both go down the river and survive because that's boring. I think that it's a fictional story and because it's fiction uh, that somebody has to die. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so about one more minute and then we're going to continue uh, with today's class. I've embedded a uh, quizzes inside of our PowerPoints for today. And we're only going to look at one chapter um, to focus on as well. So the goal is to help you all get through um, the work so that you are not hung up or quite behind. Just as a reminder, if you all have not done so already, make sure you drop your packets off at Baloo um, and pick up your new packets. Um, yesterday I was I went ahead and put chap packets for weeks four through seven in an envelope, and I'm going to mail those to your houses tomorrow. 
Um, I'm going to send them out so you'll probably get them next week just so you will have the work if you didn't get a chance to pick any of it up. Also, so that you have it for the rest of the semester. Like, I'm going to make sure you have all of the work for the term so you're not worried about um, constantly looking for it or not having it. So that way you will have it. Um, and remember, once we finish reading the river next week, we're going to write our own um, stories and we're going to call them maybe we got to come up with a catchy name. I mean, we could stick to the whole idea of the river hatchet. Um, we could stick to the idea of um, the virus, we could call it maybe or, um, you know, COVID-19 tales from tales from COVID-19. Just play off of some of the other titles out there. We'll figure it out. But anyway, let's go ahead and move past this. Today's packet, once again, we are picking up from chapter 18. So you want to make sure you have it, which is page six. Keeping up with our schedule for the week. We know that we read 15 and 16 and 17. Um, Thursday is today. We're going to look at 18 and I'll brief you on 19. Tomorrow you have chapter 20, but remember this is already uploaded on the YouTube channel and I'll upload it after our session today in case you want to finish this off. Um, that way you won't have any work on Friday. Also want to point out we are doing tutoring 3.30 to 4.30 on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. So this is the last session this week. Um, if you need some help with social studies, English, science, or math, um, Ms. Esai, Mr. Dutchman, um, and Ms. Martin and myself are all available to help you all. Um, so make sure you join us um, and I'll post it live as a reminder. So anyone is free to join. So this is where we're going to focus our attention today, reading chapter 18, the question and the vocabulary match. Okay, so continuing our conversation about how the different elements of the story are shaped by the shift in the setting, how the characters respond, and how this ultimately helps the plot to move forward, okay? So before we even get started, let's go ahead and jump into a quizzes. Remember, we jump into the quizzes and complete it and then we come back to live, okay? So I wanted to make sure we could have some fun at the beginning before we jump into our work today and then we come back. So I am also going to pin it Wait a minute. Oh. Select all. Paste, post. Pin the comment. Okay. So I pinned it so that you have it as well. And then you have the code on the screen. So go ahead and join us. And I will start once we have at least two participants in. You should be able to click, I think, the, the pen thing and it take you directly to it. Bum, ba, dum, waiting on you. In the meantime... Waiting, waiting, waiting for my participants. I'll give you all another minute to go ahead and join my quiz. Um, if no one joins, then we'll just continue on with the lesson. Ah, there's my music. If no one joins during this time, I also just have it saved for the end and we can join then and carry on with the lesson. All right, 
right, so I'll keep that pinned in the background. And I'm going to continue with our lesson. We'll come back to it. All right, so knowing that we have been talking about effective strategies while we read, activating prior knowledge, inferring what is already presented in the text and what we know, and clarifying questions, we're going to go ahead and quickly recap where we are using our story map here. Um, we left off with the idea that at this point he has, <clears throat> Brian feels despair, anger, frustration, depressed, and conflicted. We also know that his goal is to make it down the river, to save Derek's life, and to try and stay alive in the process. But he is facing some obstacles such as weather conditions, animals, food, and this idea of shelter. And dehydration is added to the list. Um, he has to continue to devise new plans as bad things keep happening um, because the radio didn't work um, as well. And this idea that it all started because he wanted to help them figure out survival school, you know, strategies on living. Okay. For those of you that missed last class or just need a refresher, we left off uh, with chapter 16 and 17 in which Brian was devising a plan to build a raft using the wood that was provided by the beavers. And after building the raft, he had to drag Derek's body onto it. And this began their journey down the river. However, he was plagued by the sun and dehydration, so he began to hallucinate about ditching Derek by the wayside of the raft. And directing the raft is not yielding as much distance as he hoped. So Brian is realizing that ditching Derek is a bad idea, and he is his only companion in the end, right? So this is also going to come up again in chapter 18. Should we ditch Brian? And you all felt, you know, both ways about that. So we're going to go ahead and pick up on page 6. At the beginning of chapter 18 and I'm going to go ahead and start our audio and throughout I will make sure that we slow it down um, so that we can discuss it so I think this one too was recorded um, with the others so it's a bit fast In the night, that first night, he learned some things about himself. Not all of them were good. He had not slept the night before except to doze kneeling next to Derek. And he had worked hard all day on the raft getting it ready. And when the sun went down and the darkness caught him, he could not believe how much he wanted to sleep. There was a partial moon, a sliver which gave enough light to see the river, or at least make out the main channel, but the light didn't help. Each time Brian's eyes closed to blink, they opened more slowly, and each time he had to fight to get them open. The mosquitoes helped for a time. They came out in their clouds with darkness before the evening cool slowed them, and Brian tried brushing them away from his face and Derek's, but it was like trying to brush smoke. As soon as his hand passed, they settled again, whining in the darkness, and after a bit, he just let them eat and kept paddling. Sleep would take him between strokes of the paddle. It would stop him so his arms would fall and the paddle would stop and lay in his lap. Then he would shake his head and snap out of it and start paddling again, just in time to make a turn, at least at first. Halfway through the night, nothing worked anymore, and his eyes closed and stayed shut. He dreamed mixes of things. His mother came to him, sitting on the other end of the raft. It's all right, she said. You can let go now. It's all right. And her voice was so soft, so gentle and soothing that he wanted to let all of it go, not to be here. So we know that our previous experience with Hatchet um, involves this idea that Brian got his best ideas uh, when he was dreaming. So in this case, um, also when he was just kind of trying to cope. Um, with life itself, we know that he falls into these deep dreams where he often is in search of answers. And in this case, we have his mom at this point as the soother for him um, and telling him, you know, it's OK, you can go ahead and let go. But we know that if he lets go, it's not just going to impact him as a character. It's also um, going to impact Derek in their survival. So he can't technically let go. So in this case, she's just trying to, you know, comfort him um, to let him know that it's going to be OK. Okay, so just kind of want to highlight how the author, Gary Polson himself, uses dreams to continue with the narrative um, and with the coping of us kind of having a sneak peek into Brian's mind and his ideas and his way of coping with things. Okay. Not even in the dream. He was not sure how long he slept, but when he awakened, the raft was drifting on a large flat plain of water bobbing sideways. 
There was no sign of the river. In the faint moonlight, he could see no banks, knew no direction to travel. But, he said aloud, the sound of his voice startled some animal and there was a loud splashing to his right. A large animal, he thought, perhaps a moose. That meant there was a shore then, a bank for an animal to run on, close. So use thought, use logic, use it, think. The river was flowing generally southeast. It must have widened into a lake. The moon. The moon was straight overhead when he went to sleep. Now it was down a ways to the right, down to the west. Like the sun, it rose in the east, set in the west. I just kind of want to highlight, remember, because we're trying to understand how a story is impacted by the setting um, and how the, the setting itself contributes to the plot. Um, so we went from daylight time and daylight hours to now it being nighttime and the moon. And then the moon has shifted from being up in the sky to being midway through it, meaning that, um, you know, it's going to trans, um, it is going to switch places, we'll say, um, with the sun eventually. Um, so with that said, morning is coming. So we're moving into morning hours. Um, so he went to sleep when it was dark and it was nighttime. And now it's starting to ease on into the morning, early morning hours. Um, so this is, if we were to look at how, um, once again, the author sets up the narrative, we're looking at how we are being taken through days and through time based off of the sun going up and down and Derek's interaction with the environment itself. Okay. So this is important and, you know, making the story believable or realistic um, to us as readers. So we're not just reading it. Um, we're also, you know, going through the motions so that we can get a vivid picture of this. The moon was about halfway down from overhead in the same direction as the splashing animal. So Brian threw water in his face. So the river had widened into a lake, but he had moved along the west bank. If he kept moving the raft with the paddle, he should come to where the river narrowed again and pick up the current. He started paddling. The raft moving sluggishly now that there was no real current. He bore to the right, moving the raft sideways as he paddled until he could just make out the shoreline in the darkness, outlined in the moonlight. Then he straightened and started paddling again, steady, reaching forward with each stroke, bending at the waist, two on the right, two on the left. While the raft followed current well because the logs stuck down into the water and were not streamlined, for the same reason it moved with the paddling horribly. It's like paddling a brush pile, he said to Derek. Nothing seems to move. And in truth, it was very slow. He was not moving more than a mile an hour and he wished he could read the map in the darkness. He didn't remember this lake or wide place or whatever it was, but if it was two miles long, it would take two full hours at least to cross it. Two on the left, two on the right. He slogged forward, and with the rhythm of the paddling, his brain settled into numbness again, and soon he was in the same trance that had led him to sleep. This time he stayed awake, but the hallucinations grew more and more intense. He saw the raft as a canoe and felt it fly forward with each stroke until he was leaving a wake of fire. Fire away. All right, so I just kind of want to pause here because we're dealing with a lot of um, stressful emotions at this point. We already said that, you know, he goes through anger and that he goes through frustration and we're seeing the buildup of it um, at the current moment. He can't see. It's nighttime. He can't read the map. He's trying to move. Their raft is not moving. It's moving even slower than it was before, which means they're not covering a lot of distance and they could potentially be lost at this point. And he has no way of correcting it or even knowing if that's the case until pretty much the sun comes up um, and he's able to see where they are and locate themselves on this map. So this is where all that information you all learned in geography class last year comes in handy um, because then you would know how to read a map and understanding the um, the ability to locate where you are on the map and where you're going is key here um, and it's key to his survival and trying to get there. Um, but as we see, the other side of this is what happens um biologically with your body itself um, when it's not fed and when you don't get those nutrients. So tying in this idea of what you all have learned in science this year as well, like your body needs certain foods um, and certain nutrients in order for it to keep going, um, in order for it to survive and maintain its stability. So in this case, if he's hallucinating, um, then he could possibly be um, suffering from hunger as well as dehydration. Um, and it could be inadequate sleep as well. Okay. So just kind of want to show you how the things that you learn in some of the other classes helps you um, to process information as you're reading it. And we're questioning the validity of the story. Um, a fictional story, even though it's fictional, should read as true as a non-fictional story where you believe what is written um, because it, it just sounds so engaging and so realistic. And it uses facts from, from life in order to make its points and uh, Gary Paulson is very good at detailing this story with sensory um, and images or imagery, um, but he's also very good in sliding in these key aspects of facts and information that you would need to know. It was curling out from the front of the raft, and he worried that it would catch the log's canoe on fire and burn them up, and how could water be on fire anyway? 
He would shake his head and then see his mother again at the other end of the raft. She would change into his father, who was smiling and beckoning him to paddle faster and faster. And then Derek's breath grew louder and louder until it filled his head, the lake, the world, with the rasping sound of his breathing. And Brian could hear Derek's heart as well, pounding on the logs of the raft, echoing until all he could hear was the keening rasp of Derek's breath and the pounding of his heart. He would shake his head and the raft would be jerking forward in the faint moonlight, Derek lying on his side, Brian leaning forward at the waist, two on the left, two on the right, the paddle pulling at the water in swirls, three strokes, four, and he would be under again. At one point, something came swimming up alongside the raft, a muskrat or otter or beaver, cutting a V in the water as it swam next to Brian. And in a fraction of a second, his mind had turned it into the head of some beast, some underwater monster with its toothed head weaving back and forth, getting ready to attack, to sweep over and take him off the raft with huge teeth. And he set the paddle down and grabbed for the spear to kill the monster, make it go away before it could eat him. And he shook his head, and the vision disappeared as the animal died, and the monster was gone, and he was alone with Derek again. He picked up the paddle and worked again, leaning forward. The bad thinking came some... All right, so at this point, he just even started hallucinating about animals attacking him on the raft as he's trying to paddle him and Derek to safety. I mean, you know, at this point, we're seeing that he is literally losing his mind. Sometime toward morning. He did not know how it started and would never know how it started and later did not wish to remember it when he did. Two nights without sleep tore at him and the raft seemed bolted down as he tried to get it along the edge of the lake to where the river moved again. Somewhere there, as he tried to keep the raft moving and fought sleep, there came the idea, the wild idea, the sick idea. The raft moved slowly because it was heavy. What made it heavy, sank it into the water so that it could not move, was the extra weight of the man tied in the middle. If the man were gone, if the man were gone, it would be lighter, and he could move fast, and it would be better. It would be better if Derek were gone. What was the difference? He was dumb enough to rise up and get hit by the lightning, and he should be gone. Brian looked down at the still form and thought the thought, and it was so awful that he did not believe he was thinking it, but it was there, the thought. If Derek were gone, just gone. None of this would have happened if Derek weren't there. Not any of it. And if Derek were gone, gone somehow, in the water. Gone down and down. No. He nearly screamed it and the sound of his voice snapped him awake, alert. And he touched Derek's leg to make certain he was still there, that Brian hadn't cut him loose in the night. And that he would always be there and that Brian would never even think the thought again, not even for an instant. All the way, he mumbled, reaching with the paddle again. We go all the way, together. He paddled another half hour, fighting sleep. And then at the same time, he felt the coolness that he knew was morning coming. And he saw that the eastern sky was beginning to lighten. He stopped paddling, looked at the sky, and was amazed at how fast the dawn came. One moment it was so dark he couldn't see Derek on the raft, and the next he could make out the bank, see the trees in the gray light of dawn, and they were moving. The banks were moving along, even though he wasn't paddling. He'd done it. He was through the lake, and it moved back onto the river, and the current had him. Thank you, he whispered, and realized when he said it that it was another kind of prayer, and that he was grateful not just for the river, the current, the movement, but the other thing as well. Coming through the night with Derek, grateful that he had made it. Thank you. All right, so... Once again, we know that these hallucinations have played uh, a major um, part in Brian's ability um, to focus on the task at hand as well as question whether Derek should be there with him or not. So let's talk about this. All right. So one of the questions that's inside of your, your packet involves this idea of Brian and these hallucinations. Um, so thinking of that, and eventually it'll come up. There we go. Um, clearly Brian is hallucinating. However, it only seems logical that Brian should ditch Derek. How would getting rid of Derek make Brian's remainder of a journey both easy and difficult? So think about this long term and short term. What are some of the implications? Like if he got rid of Derek, why would it make his trip easier to get to the, to Brenning's, um, uh, the tanning post. Why would it make it easier for him to get there? Type your responses or join me. Invite yourself to talk so that we can discuss this. Why would getting rid of Derek, meaning we just kind of roll him off the raft, make it easier for Brian to get to the post? I'm curious to know what your thoughts are.
<laughs> loser of the weight and his brain back. Yep. Uh, I said if he lost Derek, uh, he would move faster down the river. So that definitely ties into the whole idea. Yep. He will get there faster that you and um, Caleb, Tori and Caleb, you both definitely just pointed out. If we lose Derek, we can move much faster. Um, and then we wouldn't be hallucinating as much, hopefully. I also had to question, like, long term, what, what do you all think would happen if he showed up at the post without Derek? Yep, one less person to, to have to worry about. I love that point, Caleb. When we get to this third point, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring that right back up. Um, so if Brian shows up without Derek, what do you think might happen? If Brian shows up without mm. Derek, <laughs> what might people think happened to Derek if he shows up without him? Just saying. What do you think? Brian shows up without Derek. What might people think? Yep. That's what I would think. Either he killed them or he got rid of them or maybe an animal attacked him, right? So people might assume that Brian killed Derek and he'd have no way to defend himself. He ate him alive. And this ties into the previous point you said that he would be on his own again and only accountable for his own survival. And that could be good and bad because we know that Brian, um, you know, goes through these moments where he would prefer to be by himself, but then he's kind of happy he's not by himself. So, you know, if he kind of ditched Derek, he kind of would go back to this whole survival of the fittest, you know, just try to stay alive for myself versus, you know, trying to stay alive. And take care of somebody else and keep them alive too. All right. I like you all thinking. Good job. Good job there. All right. So in your packet, um, I think this is on page either seven or eight. You all have these vocabulary antonyms. Okay. So we know that antonyms are the opposites, uh, meaning of words themselves. So you had to draw a line from each word on the left column to the words on the right column. So we're just going to kind of walk through this. So if something is inaccurate, it is it the meaning that it's wrong. Um, precise would be the opposite of it, right? So inaccurate would go to precise. If something is permanent, that means it's not going anywhere. What do you think the word might be from this side of the list? Invalidate, wetness, ambiguous, unchanging, temporary, or concealed. If something is permanent, it's not going anywhere. So what would be the opposite of this? What would be something that doesn't last very long? What what word uh, could we associate with that? And we're just going to do two of these and then I'm going to make sure that you have all of them. So which word from over here do you all think is the opposite of permanent? Unchanging. Okay. I can see why you would say that. But if it's unchanging, that means it's permanent. So that would be like a synonym. So any other guess? <laughs> I'm going to say it would be temporary. So when something's temporary, it's not permanent. It's just for a certain period of time. Like temporarily, you all are to, we're doing distant learning. Temporarily, you have to stay in the house um, until, you know, we can figure out what's going, what's going to happen with COVID-19, right? So this is a temporary situation. It's not permanent, right? Um, so the next word is to ensure Meaning that, you know, if you ensure something is done, then you are making sure of. So if you're unsure, um, then that makes it 
uh, insure means you accept it. Um, it's accredited. Invalidate the opposite. Okay. To expose something is to show it for it as it is. So if I'm not exposing something, then I'm concealing it. Right? I'm hiding it. Variables tend to change. So in this case, this is where we would do unchanging. Definite, meaning we know something exactly. Um, like a definite answer is we end, school will end on May 29th. Ambiguous would be the opposite. Ambiguity in this case is around when we will return to school um, for the next school year, right? And lastly, the opposite of dehydration is what? If I'm dehydrated, you know, I need, I'm in need of water, I have a lack of water. So the antonym for this would be what? So it would be wetness. So the opposite of dehydration would be wetness, okay? If you didn't get a chance to jot this down, it's okay once again because it will be posted in our notes afterwards, okay? Let us continue with today. So our strategies after we read, our highly effective strategies, um, you know, making sure that we clear up misunderstandings, which we tend to do along the way. Now we need to create our visuals and organize it and summarize it, okay? So, we've already gone through our story. We didn't really add anything to this because we're still in the same state um, that we were in in the beginning. So, just carrying on, you know, that these are the obstacles he's still facing. He's still dealing with these feelings and that ultimately this is our goal. Um, so, it's just a matter of will he achieve this goal or not? Or is something else going to cause it to change and shift? Okay. So on in your packet, the very last page has you doing what is called a syncane syn poem, okay? A syncane poem has five lines, and most often it does not rhyme. It does not need to rhyme. And for this, you're going to write two syncane poems about both Brian and Derek. Um, and you're going to use what you know about them from the chapters um, in order to do it. And you can compare and contrast them if you want. That's completely up to you. Um, for the purposes of this, um, even though I know that this is at the end of chapter 20, I wanted to make sure I spent time um, focusing on this today in case you needed guidance. So the structure is that line one is typically one word. Line two, two words. Line three, three words. Line four, four words. And line five goes back to being one word. Now, you can, it just helps you to kind of process what you think about a character. So you can literally just use adjectives to describe the characters, or you could um, just choose specific words to help you capture what has happened in the story, okay? So the example I gave you was the idea of, you know, Santa Claus, old Saint Nick. Santa, Saint Nick, long white beard, Christmas Eve, present giver, and he's typically jolly, Right. So if I were trying to figure out, you know, who Santa was, I could just quickly look at this Sinkane poem and realize that, oh, this, you know, this is a quick description of him. So I did an example with Derek. Right. We know that Derek is a bit. So for the first line, I would put his name in this case. So one word I'm going to use Derek. Second line, we use two words. We know that he is a bit naive and that he is the recorder of all the notes um, for this journey that they're on. And we say he's naive because, you know, he allowed Brian to convince him to send all the supplies back. Whereas somebody who was more trained would have probably went back and forth with Brian and said that that wasn't going to be the case. Um, 
So he's easily manipulated and he's kind of naive to like what's going on. I mean, he should have known better than to reach for a briefcase during a thunderstorm or during lightning um, in which he could be struck by it. And, you know, it's essentially what happened to him. So I called him the naive recorder. Okay. Line three, when I had to think of three words, I thought of why I called him naive. And I, part of it was that he was struck by lightning. So Derek, naive recorder, struck by lightning. Right. This helps to give someone a bit of an insight into the type of character he is. Lastly, you have to add in four words. Right. So I was just like, OK, well, I know he was naive. I know he was struck by lightning. You know, what else could I add to this to describe, you know, Derek or the situation um, if I wanted to remember or recall him later on? So I know that he was unable to help Brian and he was unable to help Brian because he was struck by lightning and he was placed inside this coma. Um, and due to that, my final word and for line five was that he's helpless, right? So Derek, naive recorder, struck by lightning, unable to help Brian, helpless. So this is just a really quick way to capture, you know, the characters themselves um, using a different, you know, system to help you just kind of remember who they are. Um, and it doesn't need to rhyme. Um, and it's real simple. You don't need to overthink it when you're processing it. Um, so I just kind of wanted to point that out. Did you all want to try to do Brian together? Or do you want to do that one on your own? <laughs> We can try to do Brian together, but if we do Brian together, you guys are going to have to type in, you know, how you want to describe Brian. But we can do it together here. Just let me know. Either give me a thumbs up or say yes or no. <clears throat> if not, we're going to move on to summary. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to take it out of that mode so we can actually go on to the page. I will put Brian and green. So just give me a second. I wasn't sure if you all wanted to. I was going to set it up, but I didn't want to do that unless we were sure you all wanted to. All right. So Remember, if you're doing this in your packet and it's okay if you copy, you know, what we put up here on the screen, I don't mind because we are working on this together. And when I go to give you credit for your work, it just lets me know that, you know, we did it together, um, that you were following along. So I will still give you credit um, as this for your own. You don't need to do it separate. All right. So our first word we're going to do, we'll just do Brian. Okay. I'm going to put myself over here. All right. So knowing that we're going to do... What are two words that we could put for Brian? How would you describe Brian in two words or two things? What two words do you all want to use for Brian to help us describe Brian? Give me a bunch of words. We can um, move those words around as well to the other lines. So how would we want to describe Brian? I know one word I would use is handy. It's pretty handy. What's another word we could use? Waiting on you guys. What are two words or what are some words that you would use to describe Brian or that you would want to use to capture like what's going on? And if you just list them, I'll help you make sense of them. How would we want to describe Brian?
All right, so I'm not sure if you all are stuck in how to describe Brian, so I'm just going to walk through this because we're running out of time. So as I previously stated, we know that Brian is pretty handy. And we know that he's a survivor. Um... Um, down here, we know that he does whatever it takes. He thinks about others. And that he's fearless. So remember, not, it doesn't have to rhyme. It's just this idea that uh, we're just putting together some of the attributes or character traits that we know um, about Brian of things that have happened to him um, or things that he has represented over the over the course of the story itself. So in this case, Brian is a handy survivor that thinks about others and does whatever it takes. Um, and in my mind, this makes him fearless. Okay. So let us go ahead and continue. So when looking at our strategy, somebody wanted but so, we're still talking about Brian in chapter 18. He wanted to get some rest, um, but he had to make sure that he steered Derek and himself in the right direction down the river. Um, but he did take a brief nap and woke up only to question the reality of the waterfall and their safety as well as the map's accuracy. So remember, he started believing that there was a waterfall at one point. Um, another is he's starting to question whether they're even going in the right direction. So in chapter 18 of the novel, Brian is exhausted and finds it nearly impossible to fight sleep. He eventually falls asleep for a short time. And when he wakes, he finds that they are steering from um, the correct path. So they're going in the wrong direction. He comes to the conclusion that the, might, the map might not be as accurate as he once assumed. So he put all his faith and trust in the map. And at this point, and in chapter 19, which we're not reading, we're going to kind of skip over. He kind of questions whether they're going in the right direction, what he needs to do in order to get them back on the right path. Okay. So for today, we read chapter 18, and I just briefly mentioned 19. Um, we were able to answer the questions that were in chapter 18, as well as to do the Sinking poem that is in at the end of your work packet. Um, so it's at the end of chapter 20, but you can do it at any point. Um, we added to our visual map and we were able to write a summary for chapter 18. All notes will be posted after our session today. Um, just keeping in mind that at this point, today is Thursday. We just finished up antonyms for your vocabulary match and answered the question as it related to chapter 18. You need to make sure that you read chapter 20 and answer the true false questions and finish up your Sincane poems for Derek and Brian. Okay, those are your next steps. Tuesday, we will pick up from where we left off. Pretty much next week, we will be finishing up the book and the readings. Um, so we will pick up from chapter 21 on Monday and I will make sure that I post a reading for you. Um, and Tuesday we will go about discussing that reading. Okay. So that is all that I have for you today. Make sure that you turn in your work and drop off your packets at Blue so that you receive credit. Um, if you are curious about your grade, 
Um, for the end of term three, you may text, uh, you may DM me or text me on Wednesday of next week. Or I'll, I'll mention again on our Tuesday session. I should have your grades by Tuesday um, if you drop off your packets. So if you text me by or DM me by Tuesday after our session, I will let you know what your grade is in the class for term three. And, you know, term four, we are currently in. So any work that you do for term four will contribute to your grade. Um, so that is where we are. Are there any questions before we wrap up today? Hello, Cheyenne. It's good to see you, honey bunny. All right, it is 1046, and I will assume there are no more further questions for today's class. I will post our notes and make sure that if you need extra assistance that you find us for tutoring, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day.